I think we're all familiar with Laurel Canyon and its pop culture relevance, um, but I'm guessing what most of us don't know, actually you guys probably do <laughs> if you're here for this time, um, but what some of us don't know is how it's actually played a calculated role in the molding of our worldview. Jay's research into the writings of the people who helped craft the programming of our mainstream news and entertainment reveals an unimaginable level of control and manipulation. In fact, as Jay's going to talk about, these social engineers and technocrats have intentionally led us to our current state of cultural and social life. Farming. Thanks, Jay. Everyone else, you must walk over here. You must come buy books. You must attend my talk. I am a mind control handler. You must come over here. <laughs> yeah, I realized that I wasn't dressed appropriately for this. I was dressed like Thurston Howell. This is more of a chill event, so I had to take that, that sport coat off. So, Anyway, thank you guys for coming. It's, this is a very intimate setting. Um, I told Robert here that we could all join hands and take our clothes off and do one of those things. But nobody's going to do that. So, Havistock, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, when I started looking into social engineering, Tavistock, all that stuff, I never thought it would be as in-depth and as crazy as it actually is. So, the first thing that, that I think sticks out is something that we want to understand about social engineering and how this ties into the later alternative lifestyle movements and all that, which I'll get to eventually, is the Tavistock Institute. So, the Tavistock Institute became, it began as a clinic. And this was a British institute around the time of World War One, and what they were doing is they were studying shell shock. They were studying World War Two, World War One soldiers who came back, and they had like these sort of dissociative states that they'd gone into. They wanted to understand what that was, and that's when they started realizing that there were there was a reality to dissociating, to having alternate personalities. Uh, there's a great book on this, by the way, by Dr. Colin Ross called The Osiris Complex. I recommend everybody read that if you haven't read it. It's a really good book, but he goes into, he's one of the premier doctors that also has researched uh, splits and personalities and so forth. And the reason I bring that up is because it's going to be relevant to the rest of my talk. It's going to be relevant to the 60s countercultural revolution, the idea of inducing and creating dissociative states. All of this is studied intently. And it's Tavistock that pioneered this research. So before there was MKUltra, before any of that stuff that you've probably heard of, it was Tavistock that was really pioneering this, and it comes out of wartime research, wartime R&D. So Tavistock, as we said, was founded at World War I, but it became a Rockefeller institution after the 40s. So in 1946, the Rockefellers put like a giant grant amount of research into creating what would become the Tavistock Institute. So it moves from a medical psychiatric thing to a complete like mind control institution with Rockefeller money. So notice there's a, a connection between the U.S. oligarchic banking empire and the U.K., right? So this is the Atlantis' power block that you've probably heard me talk about. So this is 1946. They start, as we said, they had already perfected and understood shell shock, and then they also move into the idea of um, not just drug research, not just mind control, but also the idea of operant conditioning. So, for example, B.F. Skinner, we call it probably all heard of him, J.D. Watson. These are two premier uh, psychologists. And what they did was they said, we should look at man as an animal. Rather than viewing him as having any spiritual component, he needs to be viewed as completely a materialist, a material being, basically something that can be trained like a dog. Everybody's heard of Skinner and that kind of stuff. But most people don't know that Skinner had a giant amount of Rockefeller money as well. So it's the Rockefeller family that was really behind a lot of this. And they, that's who decided that we could we could take these these studies that were done on individual people and then apply that to the society as a whole. So you could actually use the microcosm macrocosm example. Like so, what you could do to an individual and their subconscious, you can also do on a large scale to the macro collective conscious. And even Carl Jung, Carl Jung was involved in Tavistock for a while. He also had Rockefeller funding too. So I'm not saying everything Carl Jung said was wrong. Right? I'm not saying it was all right. But I'm saying that they would basically tap the top minds to craft this perfect approach to what Timothy Leary would later call scientific paganism. He 
doesn't mean free love and you know like what you might think. He actually literally means complete mind control. Uh, if you don't know, Timothy Leary was not a pioneer, a troubadour of freedom and liberation. He was actually an agent of the CIA. We'll get to that later. So anyway, so we have to understand that wartime is perfect for social engineering because you could you could do a lot more during wartime than you can when it's peacetime, supposedly, right? But whenever we ever in peacetime, right? We're like always at war with somebody. So a lot more can be done through uh, through training people. If you think about World War II, the British, for example, had a lot of rationing. So they were actually being prepared through food rationing in wartime for what would later be rationing in terms of giant government bureaucracy, like telling you what you can and can't eat, when you can and can't eat. Uh, and something like the, the UK think tanks that put out the Plannedopolis uh, uh, videos, if you've seen those. So, shell shock and all that, that brought, in, brought, that brought the attention of Bayer, it brought the attention of the Shell Corporation, giant pharmaceutical corporation. They said, what, where else can we go with this? This is where we get to MKUltra. So the Sandoz Pharmaceutical Company, they said, I, we would like to take this idea of the psyche of consciousness and see what could be done to actually split it. Not just shell shock, we don't want to just use trauma. Can we use a chemical inducement to create alternate personas? And believe it or not, yes, they did decide that this could be done. So this is where Aldous Huxley comes in. Uh, Huxley, who everybody knows about Brave New World in 1932, but Huxley was also doing a lot of pioneering LSD research. He was doing a lot of uh, uh, tripping, and it was Huxley together with Gordon Wasson, together with uh, J.P. Morgan funding, that sent Gordon Wasson and his wife, a banker, down to uh, Latin and South America to find the perfect hallucinogens to create dissociative states. So again, a lot of people think that, and I'm not saying that all drugs are necessarily wrong or bad, uh, I'm just saying that this was the establishment's perspective of how you could utilize chemicals and drugs to create dissociative states. So there's an interesting entry that uh, Huxley has where he talks about one of the first experiences of drug trips, and he says that he noticed that it, it did it, it intentionally, or did it did uh, automatically sort of create uh, a, a forced step into one's subconscious. And so one is, of course, forced to confront their demons and so forth, and so we have to be in like a good state and all that. But he said that what we could do with this from the establishment vantage point was utilize this as a way to create a new psychology of humanity, a new way of viewing the world, and not just the world, but man himself. And that's gonna take us to Changing Images of Man, which is a central document from the establishment about how man's own view of himself has to be altered and reformed. But that's gonna be in the 70s. That's gonna be connected to Tavistock and the Stanford Research Institute. But as I said, um, we had, uh, I came across a couple of things that were interesting that I didn't know that the Tavistock Institute researched, because it's not just drugs, but it was also like corporate scams about how to sell people stuff. So for example, they, uh, they pioneered research on hair, fish sticks, and getting everybody to drink coffee. And I took a Warner Brothers tour and I noticed that uh, my girlfriend and I, we were, we were looking at the set of Friends. I never watched Friends, but she was saying that Friends got everybody drinking coffee, right? This is good. Got Starbucks really popular in the 90s. Um, but that actually makes sense because Edward Bernays plays into this, who is the father of modern propaganda advertising. He also worked with these same institutes to craft and create marketing schemes to get everybody into some fad, right? So you have the, the tie in of both the drug, the MK Ultra, the psychology aspect to it, the social engineering aspect with the World War II, World War I uh, psyops, the military studying this stuff and these private institutes studying ways to not just use this for reforming society's worldview, but also in creating ad campaigns. So then when we come to the 60s and the 70s, we have the idea of Tavistock saying, let's branch out into public health, let's branch out into hospitals, and let's make health corporate. And they were very successful at that. The Rockefellers themselves had already kind of bought off Healthcare a long time ago with the American Medical Association, American Psycholo uh, Psychological Association, those were all Rockefeller institutions. 
And Big Pharma, again, gets on in, in on this. And this is why, by the way, you have such an intimate connection between Big Pharma uh, and the healthcare industry. It's because it's all corporate. And it was all designed to be corporate by Tavistock. So, and again, uh, a lot of this is how to create management plans and management structures. So corporate uh, entities will, for example, reach out to uh, entities like uh, Tavistock, like the Rand Corporation, which we'll talk about in a minute, to, f to try to find ways to use these psychological manipulation strategies for advertising and marketing. Uh, one of the reasons, by the way, that this is so crucial, and I mentioned the Changing Images of Man uh, work, which is the 1974 Stanford Research Institute document. That was actually the basis for Marilyn Ferguson's book, The Aquarian Conspiracy, which is not a conspiracy text, it's actually a text about how the entire corporate world is going to be transformed by the Tavistock and Stanford Research Institute work. And it was, it has been. Now, one of the neat things about that that not many people know about is that it's also studied not just in immediate applications but also in phases so you have these phases of like what happens in this decade what do we do in this decade changing image of man discussed this it talks about ways that society could could atomize almost completely this the, the whole the whole structure meaning basically that everybody's alienated they're on their own they're not connected to anyone else the consumerist culture specifically does this and the Rand Corporation, one of the top think tanks in the world, if you've seen Kubrick's Dr. Strangelove, this is about the Rand Corporation, parodying it, it's a lampoon of it. Um, it's about this, you know, psychotic uh, institute that creates this, you know, sort of stage Cold War dialectic. Uh, the Rand Corporation actually does this stuff, right? It's the Rand Corporation, according to Alex Abea's book, so there's a reason that took us from uh, a more traditional society to a, a atomized society, a consumerist society. So you have to understand that that was done by design. We're not living in a, a situation where things move organically. Uh, all of this is studied decades ahead and it's implemented decade by decade. Changing images of man actually shows us this. So the reason atomization is crucial is that once everybody is disconnected from one another, they don't have any traditional bonds, uh, no ideas of heritage or identity then what you do is you bring in the new glue the new thing that brings everybody together and this is the collectivization so you basically create atomized individuals the next phase bring them into the giant collective huxley talks about this in his book the perennial philosophy for example so we're all just going to be one giant blob and that will be the giant global government all planned by the way now a lot of people too think that huxley was a good guy i don't think that he was he was part of the uh, British Eugenic Society, the Royal Institute, um, they were the, the preeminent uh, population control advocates. They wanted to basically kill off most of the earth. And the changing images of man is crucial in understanding that because it's one of these documents that says that we have to reform man's view of himself and other men. And we have to inculcate the ideology that humans are the problem and that all the humans have to be killed. Then we can create the, the, the utopia. And it's specifically Tavistock, Rand Corporation, et cetera, who implemented this anti-human agenda, as well as the Club of Rome. Um, and one of the things that Tavistock talked about was creating fake guilt. Uh, if, you, if you have been around psychopathic people or, or somebody who's sociopathic, you know that they're good at manipulation. You know, they're good at basically projecting uh, some fake, phony guilt on you that you don't, you haven't actually done anything wrong. And this was done on a macro scale by these institutes. The Club of Rome, of course, is one of the key examples of this, which is the EU think tank, which in the 1970s came up with the idea of pollution. They said, let's create some unifying problem uh, whereby mankind is the cause, and we'll say it's pollution. This is in their document, uh, The First Global Revolution. And they said that that way we could convince everybody to live small, uh, don't have kids, and accept austerity. Now, I'm not trying to offend the people that like small living in tiny houses or anything like that. Uh, you're free to do that if you want to do that. I'm just saying there's a larger agenda at play here where the bankers, who are huge proponents of austerity, love the idea of everybody living small and not having any children so that they can inherit the future. And they actually talked about that in some of their documents. These documents I'm talking about are examples of this. So austerity, in many ways, is a banker scam, and it ties into this. 
Tavistock Institute Grand Corporation, the interlocking di directorates, they're all part of this same worldview. Now, another thing that's interesting that I think we should mention in terms of Tavistock is Kurt Lewin and his pioneering work in changing people's diets. Now, again, I'm not saying if you have your own metabolism and you want to pick your diet, that's fine, that's up to you. I'm just saying, again, we're looking at things at a larger scale uh, and how this is used for social engineering. Diet is huge. The CIA, the Pentagon, they have money in shows like Cupcake Wars because that's part of culture. Culture creation, toxic culture, these are things that the Pentagon, the CIA, they're very interested in. And they will, they will farm out the work, the research, to entities like Rand Corporation, Tavistock Institute, to give them the plans and strategies for how to create mass change, right? So, for example, uh, groupthink, this is something that Kurt Lewin, one of the uh, Tavistock psychologists, came up with, was how to alter people's perspectives of groups to make, basically make them mindless zombies. And one of his first test cases was diet. He said, how can we get everybody away from the diet that they're on and onto a corporate diet? And he was very successful in that. And he did that by looking back to people like Plato. If you're not familiar with Plato, the philosopher, Plato said that the slaves should eat slave slop. They should eat the orphan slop. They should eat grains. Don't let them eat any meat or anything that might give them virility. Again, I'm not trying to defend the vegans here. If, you're, if, you, if that's your diet, that's fine. That's up to you. I'm just saying that that diet can be used as a means of social engineering. There's plenty of examples of it. One of the top globalists, Alvin Toffler, for example, he says, let's take uh, anarchism, let's take veganism, and let's put them together in a movement. He wrote this back in the 70s. Yeah, and he said, let's create a, like, yeah, like a fake leftist movement that will be like a cult. Exactly. Um, in fact, uh, Herbert Marcuse, one of the Frankfurt School guys, he says that all of the, the student movements and the social justice people, they're all his descendants. He says, they're all, they all come from me, uh, right? And, uh, and I don't think that they were genuine revolutionaries, by the way. I studied under a, a Frankfurt School guy. Um, anyway, so Lewin, Rees, other uh, Tavistock people, this is fascinating. They also talked about using gangs. This is where the CIA's uh, funding of, or, or, or basically channeling crack to gangs in LA in the 80s comes in, right? If you've ever heard interviews with Fre Freeway Ricky Ross, he talks about this. And that's because the CIA wanted to maybe basically enact a lot of these plans during the 80s in LA as a test, kit, a, a test bed for this. So what they did was they tried to break down social order by induced gang warfare. Um, and one of the guys behind this said it was fascism with a democratic face. Uh, so basically, the, the gangs would destabilize the social order. Uh, the government, uh, the CIA, the private entities, they would have certain contracts with certain cartels to allow them to operate. If the police busted some group, it would be a group that was not basically okayed by the CIA. And what this would do was to create, basically, if you think about the riots and all that, back at the... Uh, uh, Rodney King, that was a part of this. These are, this is not me making this up, it's not conspiracy stuff, this is actual, the, the people at Rand Corporation tabs that they will study this stuff like from a social engineering vantage point. Um, one of the documents talks about reducing man to an infantile arrest development state, which I think is evident Over today. Simpson. Yeah, exactly, a bunch of Homer Simpson's right. Um, this is also roughly based on the 19, or the, 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 the Tavistock Institute's uh, connection to, and the Rand, Rand Corporation's uh, connection to the Phoenix Program. The Phoenix Program was a Vietnam program to basically create psychopaths to go out and terrorize the Viet Cong. It wasn't just uh, uh, the Cold War communist stuff. This was actually being studied as a giant test tube to be brought back domestically. And I remember I, I first read that three or four years ago and I thought that sounded crazy, but the more that you read about Vietnam, the more you understand that all of these aspects of, of what DARPA and the CIA were studying and doing in Vietnam, they were absolutely test labs for what to do domestically in the US. So when you understand that the terrorism aspect of what the CIA was doing under William Covey with the Phoenix program, creating psychopaths to go kill men, women, and children, then you look back at the US with the serial killer phenomenon and with the gang violence of the 80s and 90s, it makes perfect sense. That's exactly what they were doing. They were, they were importing this domestic, domestically this, this foreign policy program of Vietnam. 
and also uh, for especially men part of that putting them in a rest of development state is to make sure that they're all into fantasy so be into furries be into your comic cons live out this yeah video game fake synthetic life and that is the the they knew that that would be where people would retreat uh, you know out, because they couldn't deal with the reality of what was really going on so you're absolutely right um this is a little side note here was that one of the rand documents talks about um that your local news, like when you watch the you know evening Channel Four news or whatever, this is the whole thirty-minute, twenty-five-minute thing has actually been studied from a scientific psychological warfare vantage point to basically take you on an emotional roller coaster. So this is why you'll hear uh, you know ISIS rips off the heads of fifty thousand people in Idlib, and then the next thing you hear is homeless man feeds a three-legged elephant in the park, right? This is literally uh, intentionally taking you on this weird sort of ride, and then you see the ad for, like, dick pills, you know, right? So that is literally done by design. Um, and these documents talk about this. Uh, human interest stories are created for psychological warfare reasons. Uh, we talked about Lewis and uh, Lewin and Rees. Um... One of the things that they wanted to do too uh, was to alter people's self-conception, not just through changing images of man, but also memory studies. This is one of the darker, crazier aspects of this that kind of blew my mind was that they, they did a lot of research, the CIA did research in the 60s and 70s on altering people's RNA and DNA and also how to change memories and self-conceptions. Uh, if you've heard me talk about John C. Lilly, the, one of the MKUltra doctors, um, he has in his book Programming and Metaprogramming in the Human Biocomputer this section where he talks about basically re imprinting and reprogramming a person through uh, a whole bunch of LSD, playing tapes over and over and over, putting mirrors in front of their faces, uh, and basically wiping people's minds to give them a completely new identity. And this really, ha I, and I was really skeptical of this for a long, long time until I read Lily's book because he goes into such detail about how this is done. Uh, to basically suppress the trauma, suppress the real identity of the person, and then they have this sort of false identity. So they were pretty successful at this, apparently, according to Lilly. Other MKUltra doctors, they're kind of like iffy. Dr. Estabrooks, he's, he first talked about in the 40s and 50s creating the courier, where you could hide people's, um, hide information in somebody's subconscious. It was iffy, I was iffy on that. When I read Lilly's book, I was like, you know, really blown away at how apparently successful he was at this. And he apparently did uh, perfect the art of the keywords, which were able to bring forth you know, the stored information or the alternate persona. So that's all apparently um, pretty real. That makes sense why now we see DARPA and these different entities talking about how they can uh, basically imprint memories in people. Um, it can be done through Big Pharma, through uh, ELF, VLF type technology. So implanted memories, that's all. You saw this in Blade Runner, you've heard me talk about that. Um, but one of the, the projects that is very mysterious, very bizarre, is, is Bluebird. And Bluebird is about this um, idea of memory and erasing memories. And most people don't know exactly where Project Bluebird comes from, but they think that it might be related to the movie, with, or the Angel to the Kid story, basically, uh, by Maurice Maeterlinck. Um, which is an esoteric occult tale of finding oneself. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but uh, it does look like in this case the, uh, the, the CIA was actually studying this sort of esoteric occult um, fairy tale to figure out how to manipulate memories. That's at least one thesis on what Blue Bluebird is or where it came from. Uh, there's a great book on this, by the way, uh, Walter Bowert's book, uh, Operation Mind Control, which is one of the better books on this this topic. But at least two of the MKUltra doctors, we know uh, Gregory Bateson and John C. Lilly were very interested in the creation of fake memories, uh, alternate personas, and how to control those. Is related to the Lilly from Superman? Um, I think it's two different people. They might have the same, similar gene genealogy, but um, I can't remember. But John C. Lilly is the guy who basically dosed all the dolphins really unethical stuff not just dolphins and like you know like giving them a bunch of lsd but but uh 
kids do. He actually wiped the minds of a bunch of kids. Um, this is also going on, by the way, in a sexual way with um, Alfred Kinsey. The Rockefellers put money into Alfred Kinsey doing basically molestation studies to see what would happen if he molested a bunch of kids. Um, so, uh, a couple things I did want to mention too. One of the fronts uh, for a lot of this research that the CIA did was the Human Ecology Fund. That was a uh, completely fake CIA operation that was farmed out to fake private entities to do a lot of this research. Um, it went under a, a lot of uh, sort of environmentalist uh, garb, right? They would, they would wear the cloak of being environmentalists and we're here to, to save the earth. But actually it was just a complete mind control operation. So uh, Taylorism plays into this. You should be familiar with that as well. And that is the idea from a guy who worked for, he was basically, his research was used by Henry Ford to create the most efficient uh, and quantitatively effective factory lines, right? So Taylorism is a, is a form of scientific management. It's a way to basically have complete control and quantification of all the uh, modes of production. Uh, if you've seen, you remember the Jetsons, right? It's like space to space sprockets and cogwell cogs, right? They're competing to have like the exact same product. But <clears throat> the reason it's relevant to what we're talking about is that Taylorism isn't just applied to the factory line. Taylorism is applied to everything, right? So full spectrum dominance, uh, the idea of the Pentagon, the think tanks to have basically control of not just human interactions and sociology, but the entire biosphere. Uh, Taylorism is part of that, right? This is where AI comes into play because AI is, they believe, the most efficient way, the most rational way to run all this stuff. So when we understand all of that aspect of things, then the, the mind control and all that, um, now it makes sense why we can look at the cults. I'm going to switch gears into like the Laurel Canyon stuff and the cults and Hollywood and all that because we can see it from the establishment vantage point of not the arts and not you know people just partying and having fun, but how that can be used for social engineering, even if the people involved in the arts or the music or whatever, they don't even know it. You don't have to know this. A great example of this was this, the student riots in the 60s. A lot of the, the students who were involved in those riots, Kent State and that kind of stuff, they were sincere. They really thought they were fighting the establishment. They were anti-war. Uh, but they didn't know that they were secretly being studied by the Rand Corporation for what's called swarming. And this is a, a, a warfare tactic that the Rand Corporation developed back then, back in the 60s, that's now used in the battlefield, right? Like just massive swarms of drones or humans, right? Uh, flash mobs, right? This comes out of the same type of research. So they didn't even know that they, and they were, at the time, by the way, they were uh, one of the groups, I think it was Kent State, they were protesting the first supercomputer. So like they were genuinely anti-establishment. They said, we're at a university. Why is our tax money going to fund this first supercomputer? We're going to go out and protest it. Meanwhile, in the background, there were a bunch of mad scientists basically studying how they got together and formed their mobs outside. And they said, how can we create flash mobs? So keep in mind that I'm not saying that everybody involved in the 60s counterculture or anything like that was completely controlled. They're all, I'm not saying they're all mind controlled. They're all, you know, beta sex kittens or what. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying that, that you can have people who sit back and watch trends move and how they grow and how they fluctuate. And that's essentially what people in think tanks and the NGOs do. Uh, who, who knew that, that uh, Houdini was a spy? Who knew that? Anybody? Nobody? Did you know Houdini was a spy? Yeah. Houdini was a spy for the Secret Service and for Scotland Yard. So I, the only reason I bring that up is that it's a fascinating tie-in between like the intelligence agencies and Hollywood back in the teens and 20s that most people don't know. So here you have this you know, very popular magician at the time. He's also part of the Secret Service. And that makes sense, actually, because he could do a lot of things that... You know, It'd be useful to the Secret Service, right? Like putting somebody on the barrel and dropping them off of a, a cliff or something. I don't know. But um, yeah, so if you if you haven't read my book, one of the things I talk about a lot in Esoteric Hollywood is the connection between intelligence agencies and Hollywood acting. 
And so a lot of A-list actors, for example, have in the past been spies. They've worked for various intelligence agencies. Uh, but Houdini lived in Laurel Canyon. So all the way back to the teens and 20s, you have this famous magi magician sets up shop in Laurel Canyon. Uh, and not only did he live in Laurel Canyon, but he was probably killed. We don't exactly know all the details. There was no autopsy for Houdini's death uh, as a spy. And then in 1959, his house mysteriously burned to the ground. So that's, that's kind of a prelude to the bizarre aspects of the Laurel Canyon scene. And then we have in the 19, uh, I think it's 49, uh, the Black Dahlia case. Most people have probably heard of this. Elizabeth Short, bizarre sort of uh, ritual murder, it looks like. Most people tend to think that this was uh, George Hodel, his son, Steve Hodel, who is a detective or something. He wrote a book, Black Dahlia Avenger. And he was in the circles of people in the Laurel Canyon scene, such as director, actor John Huston, surrealist artist Man Ray and Orson Welles, John Ford, who was also OSS, by the way, John Ford, the director. Now, the reason I bring that up is that this is also Laurel Canyon scene, and it's Hollywood's first known ritual murder. Right, everybody thinks that this was a ritual murder. Nobody exactly knows who did it, most likely George Hodel, but that makes sense because he's hanging out in some Saturnalian occultic circles. They actually, some of them worshiped Saturn. Man Ray said, I am a Luciferian. I do worship Lucifer. If you look at Man Ray's art, it's not hard to believe that. I'm not talking about his more popular art, but there's actually some very, very, very creepy stuff. Um, but this again is our next phase of out of the teens and 20s we come to the 40s and we have the Laurel Canyon scene with ritual murders and then when we think about cults uh, actually no, cults what well, yeah um, the Manson scene. everybody knows about Manson I'm not gonna bore everybody with the same old Manson tropes uh, I will mention Vito and the freaks because Vito is relevant to Manson because he's a pre Manson Manson Vito Palikas was in the Laurel Canyon scene prior to Haight-Ashbury District, and he did all the same stuff as Manson. This is very fascinating. So it's almost as if, and I, I tend to view it like Manson is a creation of mind control. I know that's kind of a controversial thesis, but uh, did you know that Charles Manson was a theta clear in Scientology? Yes. So he actually went all the way up the levels. Uh, I think that probably got him flagged as being useful to somebody. Uh, and I don't think that that's out of accord with the thesis that Manson might have been part of a drug hit. He could have been used in that way too. Uh, but there's a lot of details that suggest that Manson was not operating just on his own. That he was actually part of a network. But before Manson, you have this guy, Vito, who sets the stage for uh, the Manson cult, the family. Um, and basically, he pioneered new ways of living. He pioneered... Um, this sort of troubadour, bohemian art guy just sort of wandering around. Uh, and he was actually the means by which a lot of the bands like The Doors and The Birds got popular. Because the, it, actually in person they weren't very good musicians. Or at least the story goes. right? Because the, the music that's on the albums, a lot of that is the Wrecking Crew, what's uh, Phil Spector's Wrecking Crew. Um, but in person they were kind of subpar, so they needed a spectacle. So Vito would get basically 20 chicks to come in topless, right? So there's your spectacle, that's the draw. He's a guru. Uh, he was considered semi-divine. Uh, and again, this is uh, years before Mansico. This is basically 50s and 60s, or uh, late 50s or 60s. So we can see then that California in many ways, which I class, I used to live out here, so I'm not speaking from ignorance. Um, California is kind of a military industrial complex state. Like the whole state is nothing but like Navy bases and experimental cult, right? <coughs> um, who do we have? Heaven's Gate, Jonestown, Scientology, Church of Satan, Church of Set, too, I think. Children of God, uh, Manson, on and on and on. It's like it's like a test. It's like a hotbed for cults, right? Now, one of the sinister cults that comes out of all this 
which is brew of cults, is the Michael Aquino Temple of Set. And this is relevant because uh, Aquino was in Vietnam and he studied mind control and MKUltra and how to, he was part of that Phoenix program that I mentioned earlier, right? So again, you have to understand that in a lot of these cults, they're not just there for enlightenment, self-realization or whatever, they're also being used or studied. And that's why so many of these cults have establishment, CIA, FBI connections, infiltration and so forth. A lot of them are being used. Um, Aquino, for example, uh, wrote the famous psychological warfare document, Mind War to Psy War, where he talks about uh, utilizing a lot of the same strategies I've been talking about here. He also wrote a book about black magic and how to use black magic in warfare for the Pentagon. So it wasn't just Stanford Research that was studying like remote viewing and all that. They were also studying the voodoo, literally. Uh, in 1962, the Rand Corporation put out a study by William H. Uh, McQuafflin, uh, LSD for normies. For what? Normies. <laughs> How can we change the normies? Now you might say, well, that's a good thing. They're going to wake people up, right? Mm, I don't think the Rand Corporation gave a damn about waking people up. Um, this is where also uh, the Frankfurt School plays into this. A lot of people think, oh, the Frankfurt School, they were like, you know, critical of capitalism and they were critical of Stalin, so they were good guys, they were revolutionaries. Nah, actually they were funded by the Macy Foundation, the Rockefellers, and they were brought over by the OSS. So they were not our friends. Um, but Herbert Marcusa, Eric Fromm, Theodore Adorno, Horkheimer, I've read all their stuff, I've done talks on uh, French school guys, uh, Habermas, his praxeology and all that. Basically, they are the fathers of the social justice warrior movement, which if you, I don't, I don't know what you guys view of that is, but basically my view is that that is used as a tool. Uh, I don't think that's legitimate counterculture in my view. And Marcuse and all these Frankfurt School guys who were funded by the CIA and the OSS said the same thing. They said that they are all students of me, Marcuse said. So basically at the same time, um, as we have what might be called the counterculture left, the establishment was also interested in the counterculture right. They weren't just studying one side of the dialectic, they were also interested in the right side of the dialectic. And some writers have called this the antichrist side of the dialectic. And that's because they, these were writers who were interested in Crowley, Nietzsche, and the contrast of the Apollonian and the Dionysian aspects of religion sort of smashing them together and seeing which, almost like, again, like test tubes, like which ones worked in different areas, different different places. Uh, I have a talk that you should check out about Miles Copeland, CIA guy, a long time CIA operative, the book Game of Nations, because he writes his biography about all of his social engineering that he did as a consultant for an ad agency, that was his cover, uh, in uh, Egypt. So basically, the CIA revolutionized and changed Egypt in the 20th century, especially after the 40s and the 50s, <coughs> through all of these uh, techniques and tactics that I'm talking about. Um, and he goes into great detail to talk about how they had basically business phases for each decade of where they would take Egypt. And yes, it is that planned. But this uh, Antichrist side of the dialectic, um, wanted to create the autistic loner uh, who could basically be a cubicle savant who was good at coding. <laughs> I'm not joking. I know that sounds nutty, but uh, if you think about these people, no, that's, I would not put that past them. They would, they did, because I'm not saying that you're bad if you're autistic. I'm just saying that that kind of person can be very focused. Uh, and if you think about how that could be useful to social engineering, you can see how let's just create a generation of coders who would then code and build the big AI system and then we can get rid of the populations and live in the smart city. But uh, that's why you see the promotion of Crowleyanism, uh, Nietzsche, those kind of, those can overlap to some degree. Um, there is some evidence that Nietzsche was involved in ritual magic. Uh, but this is basically again this sort of right-wing elitist version of the system where you know, Crowley said famously that the slaves will serve. He was not at all uh, egalitarian or hippie, even though he also pioneered drug research. His drug diaries uh, were used by British intelligence. And, but the reason I bring all that up is that this was not just the creation of autism, um, which I believe was done by design on a mass scale. 
Jonas Salk talks about this in his book, The Father of Inoculations. Um, it's also the idea of the return of paganism, the archaic revival. And again, I'm not trying to offend anybody if you're into paganism. Just making the point that from the, the establishment vantage point, they study all these things, right? Like even religious views that I have, they've been studied by the establishment and used. So it's not, it's not, I'm not trying to offend anybody by saying that. But the idea here was, well, could we create a new cult, something like the ISIS cult? Could we bring that back uh, and initiate everybody into this? And, and, and the establishment basically controlled us. And yes, that's actually been discussed, the creation of a giant ISIS cult. So, <clears throat> am I going? we got about five more minutes. Okay. <coughs> you get a drink of water here. I'm going like a 90 miles an hour here. Did you get all this? Can you repeat it all and start over? Repeat. Go. <laughs> Check back later. Um, dang, I gotta, <laughs> I'm only like halfway through my notes. Um, that's why I was trying to go so fast. I want to get all this in. So, yeah. So basically, um, I did have some more stuff on the famous Laurel Canyon acting scene. We've all probably heard of the musician scene, how they were connected to military intelligence, the doors, Zappa, and all that. I'll spare you that if, you, if you're familiar with it. Um, but there's also the, they were called the Young Turks, which is the, the actors of the 60s and 70s. Peter Fonda, Jack Nicholson, Dennis Hopper, Bruce Dern. Bruce Dern, I think, is the most fascinating out of this, this uh, cavalcade here because Bruce Dern's great, Bruce, Bruce Dern's granddad was the Secretary of War, George Dern. And Bruce Dern's, all right, Laura, Laura Dern is his daughter. Laura Dern's great uncle was Archibald McLeish, who was Skull and Bones, and was also the father of American psychological warfare. So you have this very strange connections. Uh, they're also descendants of the Roosevelt family, by the way. So in other words, a lot of the Hollywood royalty do actually have a very uh, intense military and CIA background connection. Skull and Bones, of course, is the origins of the CIA. Uh, Sharon Tate comes from a military intelligence family. John Houston uh, uh, comes from a military intelligence family. Uh, Dennis Hopper, uh, I'm not sure about Ron Polanski. Peter Fonda does. Um, Jack Nicholson, interestingly, doesn't know who his father is. It's a really weird story there. But So I'm about at my time, and I thought it would be more fun since we have an intimate setting here to do like a QA. and a um, so I don't just ramble through note cards for the next 15 minutes, 20 minutes. So let's do Q&A. Um, you guys might have heard this stuff. If you haven't heard this stuff, you any crazy questions? If you, have, if, you, if you don't believe me, if you want to like challenge me, you're like, you are a fraud, sir. Let me refute you. Get out of here. I will answer your charges. So Q&A time. Oh, thank you, by the way. You're welcome. <laughs> Uh, I'm optimistic because I, I have a certain worldview that I hear to. Um, I'm not going to be too preachy about that here, but um, I mean, my my perspective is that a lot of the stuff that, that I was talking about it sounds very dark. Um, I, I was going to try to get to the, the the lighter side of things that I didn't get to, it. but. Um, the, one of the good, good things about this is that a lot of this is self-destructive. So it, when you're very anti-human and, and unnatural in the way that you approach these kinds of things, it's because it's self-destructive, I, I think that's the weakness of it. So I don't think that people are going to accept living in a giant AI smart city. I think that sounds like a nightmare. Um, it's the most unnatural thing ever. So it's going to be very hard to... I mean... There's a lot of power in social engineering, and they can create a lot of zombies. But it's gonna, I think it's going to be very hard to get everybody into this. But that's where they want to go, you know. And they have it actuaried, as I said, into decades, 50 years, 100 years. Uh, Jacques Attali, one of the top globalists, I did a talk on his book. He talks about, I think it's by 2050, is the final goal to have everybody basically mind controlled and in a giant smart city. I don't think everybody's going to accept that, but. What's crucial is like if you have kids, because it's, it's going to be those generations. They don't care about us. Like they're done with us. It's <clears> the <throat> younger people that are more important to make sure that they know to have true rebellion, right? Real counter 
establishment counterculture, not the fake establishment counterculture. Does that make sense? Okay. I'll go first then. Okay. Um, uh, you mentioned Edward Bernays a little bit in your talk, and you also have talked about him elsewhere in your work. Right. Um, his worldview is really interesting. Uh, I was looking stuff up about it. He kind of saw the masses as totally irrational and subject to a herd right. instinct, and so they had him need propagandizing, uh, a propagandizing cultural creator elite right. to guide them. Um, not to delve too deeply into like your personal views if you don't want to, but like how how close would you say your view of human nature is to that? Do you think there needs to be um, a kind of cultural elite to guide in, in, a, in a positive direction? And in that case, politics right. would be about creating the best elite, or are you more libertarian in your view of human nature as, uh, you know, is politics for you more about like liberating us from the very idea of a tyrannical elite? That's a good question. Uh, my, me personally, I'm not a libertarian. I'm not, uh, I'm more of a traditionalist, so I believe in like an organic elite that uh, comes out of the society or group or culture or tribe or whatever based on their own merits and abilities, not based on something fraudulent or created by some elite. So, uh, I mean, I know that's ideal. We don't live in an ideal world, but um, on the one hand, I think that Bernays is right that there is an elite and there's always going to be an elite, right? So we can never have a completely egalitarian society. It's not possible because there's always going to be somebody who has some ability or skill that another person doesn't have. So there is... There's always going to be hierarchies. It's, it's unavoidable. Nature is full of hierarchies, right? Um, but the question is how to have that hierarchy function so that it's not set against the herd, right? Mm -hmm. So a benevolent <laughs> hierarchy, I guess, is the best way to, to talk about it. Um, but, yeah, I mean, there's no ideals. But So Bernays is partly, or partly right, but the thing is that with his worldview, because of his sort of radical, materialistic, pragmatic, atheistic worldview, he sees it as a cultural elite that basically manipulates the mass to do whatever they want with it or ultimately dispense with it. I mean, he's ultimately also a servant of Rockefeller interests and they're very anti-human. They want to dispense with most people. So in that regard, it's very, um, it's very dark, but um, no, I, I favor like a natural aristocracy. Yeah. I think it's the best, best mm -hmm. route. Interesting. Not petty bourgeoisie, not um, you know, money to lead, but natural aristocracy. Champion. Great champion. Know, that house with no. What is that? Somebody comes out of darkness and kind of guides us. Oh. I, I mean, that's not asking. Yeah, I mean, I know what you think, like QAnon and all that BS and all that crap, but overall, just your thoughts, I guess, maybe. Um, on QAnon, I would say that that's uh, probably. Studying how we. Yeah, a lot of that stuff. Like, if you remember Jade Helm, that was like a fake conspiracy that was basically uh, the military was wanting to study. Um, uh, what they had a term for it? Um, full, not full spectrum dominance, but um, mastering the human domain. Uh, so they wanted to see what would happen in stage crisis scenarios. So Jade Helm was kind of a fake conspiracy to see how people would in, would act on the internet, and then they would gauge the results of that. Um, there was a lot of AI involved in that, very complex type stuff. But um, I would say QAnon is a, a great example of a. Um, what's called a limited hangout where you release some true information for a while and then it kind of goes off into craziness yeah um, and that kind of leads people down a, a rabbit trail red herring kind of thing so I, I wouldn't expect there to be some great savior I mean I think it's all of us individuals have to make those decisions and for yourself and locally rather than looking to some government type thing I think there, there will be more people waking up. Though. Like, I can't decide about Kanye. Like, is he? <laughs> what's he doing? Like, I can't figure it out. Does he himself. just want to run for president? This is the tree of Yeah, exactly. I mean, that was amazing. I was really shocked. I thought it was crazy that he, he promoted that. Right, right. Which was good. Yeah. But you know, I don't want to judge people's motives. Does he just want to run in twenty twenty four or whatever? But I hope he does keep promoting stuff like that. That was yeah. good because. Yeah, I mean, a lot of what I'm talking about, you can find a lot of that same information in Century of Salt, talking about the creation of the completely egotistic, narcissistic consumer. That's what Rank Corporation wanted to create, was that, and they've been very successful at that. You were uh, discussing uh, Alistair uh, Crowley 
Are you familiar with his uh, philosophical, political ideas of aristocratic uh, radicalism? Mm -hmm. How this idea of a natural elite, mm -hmm. which he said was being suppressed by uh, the economic system, where the existing uh, mercantile <coughs> elites were rising to power based on the conformist masses? Yes, I do think he's partly correct. Um, I don't agree with, uh, it depends on what you think he, he was. Do you think he was a tool of the British establishment or do you think he was really some like sorcerer or maybe both? What do you think? I, I honestly don't know, but a lot of his ideas, that concept makes a lot of sense. Yes, I think that any, I mean, in many ways he's classed as a traditionalist. He's classed with, you know, Kumar Swami. He's classed with Ganon. He's classed with Ebola and the, the traditionalists. And they believed in, you know, some form of elite, aristocratic or natural elite. So I wouldn't say that that's, like, peculiar to Crowley. I mean, a lot of people held that view. But um, in many ways, he was correct to see that we don't want bankers, homo economicus, ruling us. But Spangler said the same thing, like, you know, before Crowley said that we live in the age of economic man. <clears throat> and we need something more organic. But yeah, he's partly right. I guess there is that Luciferian element to Crowley too, where even if he had certain views which we might like, you know, he was a distributist, etc. He also probably didn't much care for humanity on some fundamental level. Yeah, I think that there's also a um, a lack of consistent application of morals in that view. Like he also says things like, "All actions are equal." Uh, ultimately, in his system, all actions are equal. So if all actions are equal, then wouldn't be hierarchy, right? There wouldn't be a natural aristocracy because that would basically level everything, not just your actions, but society and everything. Involved. Basically just monism philosophically. So I would say that that's problematic. It's, it's inconsistent. And a lot of these people aren't consistent. So people have different views at different times. And, uh, the whole climate change deal, all these people who never cared, all of a sudden care. And uh, that and the proliferation crazy weather modification technology. Yes. And so, me, my basic assumption is climate change is a total lose in what they're telling us, the right. and all that shit. Right. And not good. But that it's actually just a program yeah. of using the weather, like the Club yes. of Home statement, yes. where drought, famine, becomes the this, the that. Exactly. Yeah. Anyway. No, I think you're right. Uh, all the real things get co-opted. So what happens is a lot of things do start organically. Yeah. It's not all created by some mad yeah. scientists but, yeah. or CIA, but things will start organically and then kind of be steered off. Um, if you read Weird Seeds Inside the Canyon, that's one of Dave's theses is that the, an, the genuine anti-war sentiment amongst the musicians was steered off into hedonism and just blowing your mind out, basically creating the dead end. made for soundtracks of war movies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Um, but Vietnam was one of the first places where they really started experimenting with geoengineering. Um, yeah. So the Agent, Agent Orange Spring, that's, yeah. Yeah, that's uh, environmental modification. Yeah. And so geoengineering is very real. I have a whole section oh, yeah. of that in my next book. A lot of people don't believe it. They don't think that's real. There's no such thing as weather. That, that's been going on since the 50s. Oh, yeah. World War II. It's like the lines and stuff like that. Jim Lee, I don't know if you're in the foyer, I'm on the net. Climateviewer.com, he's got weathermodificationhistory.com. That's oh, okay. insane, yeah. he explains. Right. I mean, it's smart. Right, well, Stanford Research that we talked a lot about here, they have a whole site dedicated to weather modification. Yeah. It's called the Stanford BLF Project. They have yeah. papers on art and all kinds of stuff. So, yeah, oh, it's yeah. all real. Yeah, you were uh, discussing the Black Dahlia murders. What's interesting is I have a personal connection to that because my great-grandfather was a uh, personal friend of Hodel, wow. and he was also a suspect in the murders. Wow. Uh, do you have any idea who, who, did, who committed the crime? I've, I've, I've seen two books, the Steve Hodel book, and uh, there's a book called uh, uh, Black Dahlia... Um, Exquisite corpse about the Black Dahlia case, um, and they both point to Man Ray and probably, probably Steve Hodel. You know, you don't think it was Steve Hodel or George Hodel? That's what I meant. Yeah, yeah. Steve's the son. Probably most likely. You think so? Yeah. I think with my uh, ancestor, I've no, I mean, I have no idea what happened, but it's probably just the guilt by association because they were close friends. I think that's what happened with uh, Orson Welles too, because Orson Welles was a suspect for a while. Oh right. Mm -hmm.
but you know they're all in the same crew. So I think uh, George Adele was convicted of incest, so it makes him more likely. Do you think all this? Uh, yeah, to a degree. I mean, like, you know, for example, Crowley would talk about it on his drug trips, you know, the entities that he interacted with. He would call it, you know, exo dealing. Aliens, right? Um, exo theology. It's the same idea, these interdimensional entities. Yeah, I think it's what uh, the religions have called demons, absolutely. I think it's true. I have a question. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the social justice warrior movement mm -hmm. as a tool. Could, right. you, could you talk to that a little bit? Right, so what I was getting at was that the first thing that they studied back in the 60s was mobs. And this was a Rand Corporation was studying how to get people to just kind of create a big mob on the scene, kind of flash mob basically um, and this has been studied by for example the British Ministry of Defense they have a whole paper that they did uh, about 2005 or 6 where they they talked about how in the next 10 to 15 years they foresee the the wide-scale usage of flash mobs and so I'm just saying that that Antifa uh, and social justice warriors that kind of engage in that kind of activity they seem to fit that model Maybe not every single person, but basically hired or people that are kind of coerced or bust in at times. And sometimes they bust people in to kind of do these big stage kind of events. Yeah, and it's not just the left. Like, it, the they they do the same thing on the right. So like, you'll have the FBI can be running one group on the left, and they're also running another group on the right. Yeah, they'll do the same thing on the right. So like, you'll have the FBI can be running one group on the left, and they're also involved in the, in the same far right people again. So they can stage and manage these kinds of. Dialectics, basically. Do you know what I'm talking about? With dialectics. Maybe go into that. Well, dialectics is just the idea that um, that if you don't take a position, you can kind of be superior to a right or a left position. Right? So sometimes it's it's it goes back to like Far Eastern philosophy of black and white, you know, yin yang, right? But it can also be used from a social engineering standpoint to control two sides of some issue. Um, so, for example, an oil company, you might think, oh, they are against the green agenda or they're against, they're against um, climate change. But then you find out, well, wait a minute, why is Shell, BP, some of the biggest funders of some of the climate green stuff? And that's because they would like to control not just people who support oil companies, whoever that might be, uh, but also their opposition. So it's basically the idea of controlled opposition, control both sides of these groups. So it's the same. It's an old tactic that goes back to Caesar talked about doing in his Gallican Wars. He talked about creating um, managed conflicts between the tribes so that they could never rise up against the Roman Empire. If you get them fighting each other, hmm. so dialectics is just an old strategy of, of warfare. It's also really effective in terms of keeping people unable to see a larger picture. Yes. You know, I mean, it's like, it's like a stained glass, like you have like pieces of the stained glass and the other person is on the other side of it and they see like different colors, but you don't see like the full picture of the stained glass or something. That's a bad analogy, but it's exactly yeah, right, it's like, yeah. It's like the Porto you know, like you can stretch this bungee cord between these two extremes and smash them together at will. It's like a super effective yeah. strategy and then it keeps everybody from actually seeing that there's a larger thing. Like yeah, like Democrats and Republicans. Like yeah. there's a lot of the same corporate entities fund and control both sides of, the, of that fake dialectic. This comes but, out. But people pick a team. Yeah. Right. So people feel, you know, vehemently. Right. Just, Coke, uh, Pepsi, vehemently Democrat, right. Republicans. Right. Like uh, Procter and Gamble might own both toothpastes. Right. And you think you have a choice between these. It's the same company. Same company. This is Robert Stark. I, uh, I am joined here with uh, Jay Dyer at the Mercado Sergado in uh, Pyramont Ranch in Agoura Hills, California. Uh, Jay's book is uh, Esoteric uh, Hollywood. Uh, Jay, great talking to you. Thank you, Robert. Glad to be here. 
Jay, uh, tell us, our audience, uh, how did you originally uh, get interested in these uh, themes? I remember when we interviewed, uh, we talked on my uh, podcast, The Stark Truth. You had a lot of these in- interest in films growing up in the 80s. Right. And when did you start to become more interested in the more uh, esoteric uh, themes involving uh, symbolism? Um, probably college era. So when I got into college, I was looking at uh, espionage and psychological warfare and originally separately from film, but then I read some pretty crazy books like Sinister Forces, uh, and that kind of hit me to the idea that there was a connection between intelligence and movies. So then I decided at grad school, you had to pick a thesis to do your master's thesis on. So I picked Ian Fleming and, and looking at how um, Ian Fleming, who was a high-level British intelligence guy, was using the Bond character to kind of uh, portray real and fictional accounts of his own exploits and other spies as well. But there was also a lot of esoteric stuff that started tying into the Bond series, like he would name characters after um, esoteric ideas, he would use um, tarot card themes, for example, in Live and Let Die, uh, Voodoo comes into Live and Let Die, uh, and then Crowley actually becomes a basis for several villains, um, not just uh, Blofeld, but I think a couple other, or call a couple other Bond villains have a Crowleyan aspect to them. So I started realizing, well, there's also like this esoteric occult side, there's also this intelligence side, the films, and they all kind of interact. Um, and just the more that I read, the more I saw that, that these three worlds that seem different to most people are actually really interconnected. I have to be careful with my license. So uh, you're, you came to LA and you've, uh, you've lived in LA before this region. Are there any significant uh, esoteric uh, sites in LA in particular? That's a great question. There are quite a few. I mean, like, the, actually the whole state, in my view, is kind of a military industrial complex state. I mean, my dad was in the Navy, so we were stationed when I was a kid at the base in San Diego. Um, but I didn't realize then that there's, like, Navy SEALs, there's Camp Pendleton, there's all the way up the coast. It's just, like, basically nothing but naval research. And actually, in terms of intelligence stuff, a lot of the really secret high-tech stuff is Navy. So not even, like, they'll produce stuff that maybe the CIA will use 10, 20 years later. Um, so my dad, when he was doing, he was just an enlisted guy, but um, I didn't realize it at the time, but he was talking about directed energy weapons. He was talking about Tesla-type tech that was on his naval vessel back in in the 80s. Um, so in, in the regard to, like, the secret tech, there's that whole side of it. In regard to, like, the esoteric stuff, I mean, yeah, I would say that you have... The, the Catholic founding, obviously, which is which is interesting to, um, to California, but there's a huge Freemasonic element to, to California too. Like a lot of the downtown LA area buildings are um, Masonically, you know, structured in terms of architecture. Can you give um, some uh, particular think, examples? Um, there's a big bank in downtown LA that is specifically Masonic. Uh, the the bank tower, the skyscraper. That sounds right. Um, there's a great, my buddy did a whole podcast just on Masonic uh, structures in LA. Uh, the Griffith Observatory is a great example. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. It's nothing but like, like Rosicrucian, Copernican, you know, which, but Copernican, Copernicus was into uh, Rosicrucian esoteric stuff. Um, and then if you go in, you'll see like Plato and Pythagoras are kind of like painted up on the, it's like, it's almost like a secular esoteric uh, cathedral in a way. Either. Yeah. Well, the thing about a lot of those structures, a lot of them are uh, aesthetically uh, pleasing. Right. So, yeah. with the kind of role that aesthetics play, is uh, there's kind of this aspect of aesthetics as a cult symbolism. What is the role of aesthetics? I guess you could say architecture too, but particularly in film, uh, using aesthetics, visual imagery, and music as special effects and creating this atmosphere, and how does that impact the human psyche? It's about uh, capturing the imagination, right? So I mentioned Gregory Bateson in the talk. Bateson has a whole book on how to capture human imagination, and he's part of the MKUltra. Uh, Disneyland, you know, when, when Disney talks about, what do they say, they're like the crafters of imagination. Or they, they use imagination as sort of their tagline. 
and that's because they are specifically the sort of the Pentagon DARPA yeah, aspect uh, of controlling the youth. Type. Disney is really the, the test bed for that. The CIA actually helped uh, Walt Disney get the land to set up Disneyland, and it has its own constitution and all that. But um, the arts are a way to um, to portray what's in your subconscious, what's in your inner world, your inner psychological associations, and to project them out into the external world and to influence people in the external world. Um, that's what the arts do. So in that way, it's a craft, so to speak. Um, and it uses all the mediums, right? Sight, sound, all the senses are involved in the arts. And that's where the esoteric can come into play because you have, for example, in the esoteric world, the idea of something like color magic, which, which sounds strange, but a lot of, for example, police departments or um, psychological warfare, they'll study the usage of color and how color affects the psyche or the subconscious in order to craft anything like um, sometimes they'll paint interrogation rooms a certain color to calm people, right? That's essentially the same idea as color magic, right? Using colors to create or cast a spell or create a certain effect in the audience. So that's one way that, but I mean, sound is the exact same thing. Like we were talking earlier about sounds. Sounds cause effects uh, because they're waves. We are basically receptors, like we're basically tuning forks that receive all of these vibrations. Not to sound too new agey, but that's actually true. Um, and those vibrations can affect us. That's how it comes into play with like uh, ELF, VLF, and, and Brzezinski in his books, he talks about using different frequencies and waves to control people. Michael Aquino talks about this in his books. So there's a, absolutely a direct connection between the arts um, and the esoteric. With the uh, films and music you enjoyed growing up, when you uh, study the occult uh, as aspects and attributes, does that uh, taint your enjoyment of that work? Or are you able to kind of separate the two? Uh, that's an interesting question. Um, I, I, I try to take a pretty objective stance or as objective as is possible. So no, it doesn't really uh, taint my my take on it because I can see it for what it is. Like I might not agree with transcendental meditation, but I can appreciate the different layers and aspects of a Lynch film or, or David Lynch's work without necessarily being into Zen Buddhism or Tibetan Buddhism or, or any of those Far Eastern philosophies. I can still appreciate for what it is. So no, not necessarily. I mean, unless I find it just like too disgusting or degenerate. I, remember. I, I was watching something that I like, okay. even Hereditary. I don't know if you saw Hereditary. But it was, I heard it was uh, good. I'm going to check it, it out. All, it was know, a little satanic? Or? Well, it was like yeah. really hardcore uh, ceremonial magic. Mm. But Kenneth Anger is probably side. someone that you might be yeah, a little, if I mean, you're on. Yeah, I watch Kenneth Anger stuff and I don't. A lot of it feels that. like uh, we more watched direct. It last night. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I enjoy some of his work, but there, I mean, there is a mixed thing there because a lot of Kenneth Anger in particular does deal kind of directly with what feels like yeah. you know what would be called satanic at least regardless of whether or not you believe but, in that but actually yeah. there's an aspect to which you could still learn from that because if you watch something like inauguration of the pleasure dome you're seeing his vantage point of what he sees the 20th century in hollywood bringing yeah no, Hollywood it, is bringing the pleasure dome which is part of the new satanic aeon yeah yeah and it's interesting in his work how you see the you're talking about like the dialectics i mean his work will feature swastikas and stuff like right. that but also he's very tied in with the hippie movement so you really see yeah. the kind of meta dialectic there um, in an interesting way so i've always appreciated his work but i've also kind of i do think it has a certain power not to sound too hokey but you know if you watch mm -hmm. it yeah what do you think about the idea or concept that there are these uh, filmmakers within hollywood lynch is obviously david lynch is a name that's put out you could also make the case with uh, stanley kubrick mm -hmm. and eyes wide shut who are so working within hollywood and uh, working subversively and giving out clues mm -hmm. Yeah, it's always hard to tell exactly what people's motives are, but I mean, I remember back in the 90s when Lost Highway came out and it didn't do well in the box office. Um, they were never, a movie like that would never come out in the box office now. But even yeah. then they were saying that that was David Lynch's middle finger to Hollywood, which I would say that's probably true. Yeah. I mean, it's so bizarre, so I guess genuinely avant-garde. Um, and even the new season of Twin Peaks, I mean, I think partly the reason why it didn't get made or almost didn't get made for so long was because it was they probably saw it as too bizarre. I mean, that's what they said about the, the show that we did, is it was too much, too bizarre, too cerebral, all that stuff. Too weird, using too many words nobody knows about. So, um, yes, I think some of the directors, even ones that get to a certain level who had to compromise to get to that level, Kubrick definitely did because of 
working with NASA and all that. I think he still wanted to be an artist, um, do his own thing. It comes at a price. So I think if you if you're willing to pay that price, then you become an outsider and you don't get you know, the commercial gigs. Hmm. But some people like Kubrick and Lynch find a really interesting balance they there. They find a balance. Yeah, and so. they're, they're kind of a. I don't know, I definitely look to them um, as people who have kind of infiltrated the elite and, and are, are putting something more positive, I think, or just more interesting and better yeah, out there. At least, uh, yeah. at least interesting, right. Yeah. Can you tell us about uh, your uh, film project? I know you're limited in what you can tell us. But. Uh, the new one? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, well, we... Uh, Hollywood Dakota, I thought, was a great model, a great idea, um, but, of course... It wasn't renewed, so there was, there's not going to be a season two of that. Um, but other people reached out and with different ideas for maybe a more a more broad approach to not just looking at movies, but also uh, other aspects of culture, right? So uh, rock and roll, fashion, um, all that, as well as Hollywood. And I think you, you have to because, you know, people who were esotericists weren't just interested in Hollywood. They are also interested in the rock scene, the music scene. It all ties in. You have to look at all of it. So I think it's actually a better, stronger idea. Um, so that's kind of what it's, it's, it's going for. But I don't think I can say much more than that. So hopefully it'll get picked up. Uh, it's going to be you know, pitched to some, some bigger networks. It just become very, very... Uh clear to me that there really is uh, an agenda <laughs> you know that they actually will talk about this directly it's like oh how are we going to reach middle america how are we going to reach the sandwich guy in podunk arkansas um and uh and you know how are we going to make him more liberal um is basically it's very open discussion so uh, i just wanted to share that because it's well uh it's interesting to hear that that it's sort of openly discussed because um i don't spend a whole lot of time in you know like production crews or, or yeah. around the kind of circles that you would be talking about so uh, you know, a lot of what I do is look at like white papers and, and establishment people's books and documents themselves just to see what they say. Um, that's kind of what I try to do in the Globalist book series, the lectures mm -hmm. that I do is look at their work, see what they say, try to, you know, digest that into nuggets that people can take. Um, but there's no question that, that that's, it's not just about money, in other words. It's not just, let's, how do we make our show popular with big, audiences and ratings and all that. It's also social engineering. And that's because, and it just came out, this will be in my, my second mm -hmm. book, that it wasn't just like a, people initially thought that in the last few years through FOIA requests that the Pentagon and, and the CIA and these different entities had put money into like 200, 300 productions. It's not. It's like thousands yeah. going back forever. Mm -hmm. um, and into the networks, I'm sure. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So they, so, and it's not just, net, there's also private companies that want you know, messages put into the phone. Yeah, well. yeah. So there's a bunch of agendas at work, but yes, it is ultimately social engineering, absolutely. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just throw it out there. I, I, my impression with the people I work with, it's not like super conscious on their part. They're just right. the writers. They just have this worldview, and it's it all works. You know, I guess what you were kind of saying earlier, you know, maybe certain entities set things in motion, but then it, it kind of it does kind of work organically after that. I, in my from my perspective, yeah, that's right. what it seems sure. to do. I mean, these are just upper class uh, liberals in, in LA, and this is their worldview they have, and they really see it as a moral mission to, yeah, they have to prop propagandize. Them, right. Yeah. Um, so cool. That was that question. And we have a few more if you're sure. so around. Um, just because we're in LA, and because it's, I'm actually going to restart the camera real quick. Yeah, just since we're in L.A., I thought I'd ask about Charles Manson. Um, what are some of the chief theories you might uh, subscribe to with regards to that case? Um, was Manson being pro uh, handled by a higher cult, perhaps, related to the processed church? And I guess also, the more I look into it, the more it's like, well, was, was Tate's murder, was that a ritual sacrifice? Yeah, I think that there's basically two ideas here. That it's either a drug mob hit, and there was a there is a mob connection to the circles that Manson was in, or was it a ritual murder? And it could be both. I mean, it, and if it's the ritual murder angle, a lot of writers think that. If you read Mari, Mari Terry or Peter Lavenda, they argue that it was not just about that event, but also making that a big ritual murder for the alteration of America. So that it was actually yeah. a ritual murder that, like JFK, like RFK, like MLK, these events, these assassinations had nationwide 
psychological work to change the culture yes in other words exactly. yeah yeah and so i think you could see the manson murders having that impact absolutely i mean it that ended is, the 60s and brought us into the 70s and exactly. some very and i think it shows that there is like dave writes in his book where she's like ken there is a dark side to the hippie stuff oh it's yeah. not just you know free love crap there's also this sort of it's consciously satanic element mm-hmm. but that Kenneth Anger captures so well and of course did. Kenneth Anger I heard you talking about this recently Kenneth Anger had some connections to to Tate and to Anton LaVey and to Bobby Beausoleil right. uh, of course and so some of those connections are interesting if you look at someone like Roman Polanski who was Tate's husband yeah. but also you know and a right. people file uh, yeah and uh, and made Rosemary's Baby so it's like what is all why are all these ideas of Satanism and sacrifice clustered together around these this set of people well and she played um roles uh, 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 you know esoteric she plays a witch she plays I think she claimed to actually be a witch at one point in real life um, she comes from a military intelligence family she, Tate that is um, she played that similar that kind of role in Eye of the Devil um, so it's it's definitely there um, now the actually demonstrating this I think you can look at hard evidence between the connections with the, the process church and British intelligence because they would in, they would in, they would uh, the process church interviewed Savile they in, interviewed uh, Mick Jagger pretty famous people as well as Manson um, I do think that's who's in the background they do have a British con- uh, intelligence connection uh, that's what's most likely um, as to who might be the higher level cult and then uh, authors like Mari Terry and Ultimate Evil you know, he speculated that there might have also been a connection to Son of Sam, that uh, hmm. Son of Sam murders, that there's <clears throat> the same kind of people in the background. I think that's plausible. Yeah. Have you been to Spawn Ranch? I have not. Yeah, here yeah, in L.A. And one time a movie set, right? Yeah, it's, yeah, it looks pretty much exactly like this. <laughs> okay. And probably back in the 60s, it would have had structures like this. It all burned down in the 70s. Uh, but yeah, I, I have been. It's it's uh, interesting. It's uh, not really marked out in any way. Yeah. Um, pretty nearby. But yeah. So, but then there is that mob angle too, which I think that could be involved with, you know, drugs and hit. And there's rumors of um, people like Peter Sellers and, and pretty big name actors, yeah. just, you know, having like uh, pornographic type films that were made mm-hmm. of them. That, and of course, Peter Sellers was in Lolita, like Kubrick. So, and, and th- yeah. that's there's rumors that that might have been involved in part of what was going on in covering things up. Yeah, why people had to be killed. Interesting. Wow. <laughs> One thing I find ironic with the theme of uh, Crowley is that uh, you see this kind of interesting dichotomy where both figures within the uh, establishment and Hollywood elite are fascinated with Crowley, but he's also a lot of uh, avant-garde uh, counterculture, not so much the mainstream counterculture, but a lot of the more dissident counterculture figures. Uh, Matt, can you think of some good examples? Of people that are interested in him? A lot of... Uh, well, dis- Kenneth Anger is the, yeah. the, probably the most clear example. Um, really just... Uh, oh, like uh, the folks at um, Countercurrents, that website. Oh, sure. Tend to have some, like James O'Mara. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. So he, uh, people... From a political a, dissidents are fascinated with him pe- as Both well, people so. from the dissident right and the dissident left are fascinated by Crowley. And, He's and, kind of a meta-dialectical yeah. figure yeah. in as that well sense. As well as people like Dennis Hopper and Dean Stockwell. Oh, and Ozzy Osbourne and mm-hmm. rock, rock and Rollers, right. yeah. Manson, Marilyn Manson. <laughs> how, do you, how does uh, Crowley relate to those two themes? Why, why is there such an appeal by both people within the more, what you would call the inner circle, and then these kind of uh, dissident outsiders? Good question. I would say that because from the vantage point of those who are social controllers, technocrats, social engineers, like I was doing, speaking about the talk of a left and a right, I would say that because Crowley thought that we were entering a new aeon, and essentially all the people who claim to be a magus, you know, whether it be Anton LaVey or uh, Michael Aquino, they all thought that this was some special period of a new aeon, a new age of some kind. And so I think that if you are a social engineer, anybody who's promoting the idea of a completely new way of doing things, of viewing the world, of establishing the world, of a cleansing of the world, I mean, it's kind of apocalypticism. Um, you know, there's that apocalyptic element to Crowley in a lot of the, the cults, you know, whether it's Manson uh, or, or the Babylon working and that kind of stuff, the idea is that we're going to uh, usher in this new age. So I think that from the power structure stand- standpoint, they see that as useful, whether they believe it or not. Yeah, that's ironic that because that same that same theme of reinventing the world can exist yes. b- within both the establishment exactly. and anti-establishment. 
both in kind of tap into it, I guess, the word I'm using today is like meta dialectical kind of intellectual spaces, which, um, I mean, th what we're doing right here is kind of that because we're at a, a hippie fair and we're talking about this yeah. stuff. So that's kind of cool. And I think that's what you do a lot with your podcast, Robert, is uh, try to find that. It's not even so much finding common ground. I mean, that's the kind of flowery way of saying it, but it's also just like getting beyond the bullshit and just like taking a, as close to like a kind of objective view of uh, culture like as you can and you find that there are these common threads that are, are made to appear opposites by whomever, whether it's mainstream media, globally, whatever you want to say, and that there's actually a lot of common ground. Um, and even where there's not common ground, there's at least a lot of space for conversation that doesn't involve like well, fist yeah. fighting. Yeah. Uh, Robert Anton Wilson makes that very point in his books. If you read Lucifer Rising or, or the other ones, he says exactly what you just said in that thread. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting kind of energy that you can tap into. But I mean, this is pretty much a, a hippie fair. So how did you get this gig? Um, one of the people that puts it on, her name is Heather. She is a longtime reader of my site. Yeah. Um, she is friends with Sean Stone too, and she had Sean Stone come, I think, last year to speak. Um, gotcha. And I know Sean has been on his show a few times. And then he, he spoke last year, and then she asked me to come this year. So. I see. Are there any other events or talks that you're planning on attending today that you'd recommend, or mostly just... Um, I, I don't know a whole lot about this event. I know there's a lot of musicians that sounded pretty neat, but um, I, I had uh, a whole bunch of stuff to do while I was up here. So I gotcha. I did an RT yeah. interview, yeah. and I did an have... audition. Got... Oh, yeah, yeah. Nice. Any other questions, Robert? Yeah, got it. Okay, cool. Um, so remind us uh, where we can find you on the web, and is there anything else you'd like to add? Uh, no. Uh, you can go to jasonalysis.com. Uh, all my essays and articles are there. You can subscribe there. Uh, my YouTube channel as well, Jay Dyer. And uh, the second book, The Star Collier with Two, is complete. It'll be out uh, December, and then hopefully we'll have a new TV show as well. Great. Thanks a lot, Jay Dyer. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Thank Robert. You. Mercado Sagrado, the sacred market. Yeah, I just want to get the.